go to the final paragraph of the prophets. Okay. And we just talked about the prophets are Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the 12. So this means going to the very end of Malachi. But think through what is in all of that. Yeah. <laughs> we, so much just, history. Yeah. And we just summarized it. It's a history of failure. Yeah. And then a history that... that how, ma- how many that, centuries are we talking about? Oh, well, it depends on when you date the events of the book of Joshua. So some people debate if it's in the 14th to 12th century. So let's bat in the middle. Let's okay. just say it's around the 1200s. <laughs> okay. And then it narrates down to the exile to Babylon, which happened in 586. So that's about a yeah. six, little over 600 year stretch. Okay. But then... Somewhere in there was King David. Yeah. And, yep. That's right. And that's right. His whole crew. And then there's three prophets at the end of the 12 prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. And they are all located after the people first returned to the land from Babylon. Okay. So, oh, yeah. Ezra, Nehemiah. Which... In the days of Ezra, Nehemiah. That's part of the right. writings. The book, the story of Ezra Nehemiah is in the writings. Okay. But three prophets who were, did their thing in those days are in the end of the prophets. So okay. then that takes you another hundred years forward. Okay. Into the late 500s, 400s. So it's like, you know, a long, many, yeah. many centuries. Okay. And so we're going to go to the last paragraph of Malachi. So we're going to fast forward like 800 years. Yep. Totally. To the end of Malachi. And Malachi is standing in a day when Israel has some of Israelites have returned back to the land and they've staked out a life in Jerusalem. And this is what we call the second temple period second, because they yeah. rebuild. They rebuild the, set, the temple. The temple. And Malachi is convinced that what's happening in the temple is just totally offensive to Yahweh. This new temple. Yeah, the new priesthood is offensive to Yahweh. The, some things don't change. Something, yeah, the people and the way they worship Yahweh. They allow injustice in the land. And so Malachi says, you know what? That thing that happened with Babylon, that was just the lead up to like the bigger, even more bigger, badder decreation that Yahweh has coming. And he calls it the day of the Lord. How you guys doing? Yes. Jesus does uh, at the very end say things like that. And when Jesus finally disappears, um, there's this rather odd record in the book of Acts where an angel says, this same Jesus who you've seen go will come in the same way. There is a major problem here, which you better name right off the top, which is the problem um, which looms more large again, I'm sorry, in America than anywhere else, because American dispensationalism with the idea of the rapture has actually turned the idea of Jesus' second coming into its opposite. In the New Testament, the second coming is not Jesus coming back to scoop up some people and take them off to heaven with him. In the second coming passages in the New Testament, Jesus is coming back to rule and reign and transform the world and make it over anew. And that is actually part of the whole New Testament package of new new heavens and new earth. That, um, uh, put it another way. There's a couple of verses in the New Testament which, instead of talking about Jesus coming, talk about Jesus appearing. This is in Colossians 3 and 1 John 3, if anyone is wanting the references. What does it mean, appearing rather than coming? And here we have a problem because of our implicit cosmology. We have an implicit cosmology in which heaven is a long, long way away, probably up in the sky somewhere. What that says about Australia and New Zealand, I'm not sure, but we think of heaven as a long way up in the sky. And then we think of Earth as as all the way down here. So we think of Jesus as coming like a spaceman, having to make a long trip from somewhere else. And I, I know because I've met them and I've had letters from them, there are a lot of people who take that as completely literal language, as though heaven is a space within our cosmos. That is not how the Bible uses the word heaven. The word heaven has a multiplicity of meanings, but in this sense, heaven is God's space, and God's space is supposed to be eventually integrated with our space, call it earth, if you like. And the point is that at the moment, it is as though there is a great curtain hanging down through the middle of ordinary reality, so that at any point in any place, God is not far away, Jesus is not far away, 
It's just that they're currently invisible. But one day, the curtain will be pulled back, and it won't be like coming, it'll be like appearing. You imagine the gasp as if somebody were to yank a great curtain back there, and we suddenly realized all sorts of things going on behind that curtain that were actually integrated with our reality and we didn't realize it. That's as good a picture as the idea of him coming. Now, part of the difficulty here is that some of the passages in the Gospels which have traditionally been taken as predictions of Jesus coming back after a long period are not, in fact, they are predictions of the fall of Jerusalem. In Mark 13, for instance, in the parallel passages, it doesn't begin with the disciples saying, when are you coming back? It begins with Jesus saying, all this stuff's going to come crashing down, and the disciples saying, when? When will that be? The difficulty is, and this is a real difficulty, especially at 8 o'clock at night when my body clock is telling me it's 1 o'clock in the morning, excuse me, um, that the language which they used to describe events like that was what some people have sometimes called apocalyptic language. That is to say, things like the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon will be turned into blood and the stars will be falling from heaven. Now, generations of Christians have thought that Jesus was predicting the end of the space-time universe. However, when you trace that language back into the Old Testament, and that bit about the sun and the moon and the stars comes from Isaiah 13, it isn't talking about the collapse of the space-time universe, it's talking about the fall of Babylon, which was the greatest empire of the day when that was written, or around the time that was written. Because when this huge empire, which has dominated the horizon, suddenly falls with a crash, what language are you going to use? What poetry can you use to signal that? And when it's Jerusalem, and if you're a Jew who believed that that was the city where God had promised eventually to come and live forever, if that falls with a crash and the temple is burnt to the ground, you're going to talk about the sun and the moon and the stars. I mean, even in our political discourse, we talk about landslides and earthquakes, and we all know that that's a metaphor. Well, they all knew that this language was a metaphor. My colleague John Barton in Oxford, I remember saying in a lecture once, uh, that we ought to know as a matter of literary genre that if an ancient Jewish text says the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood and the stars will fall from heaven, we ought to know that the next line is not going to be the rest of the country will have scattered showers and sunny intervals. You know, this is, this is, not, this is not a primitive weather forecast. Um, and and there's, it's a very telling. The prophet Jeremiah had prophesied that Jerusalem would fall, and he said that that would be like the whole of creation going back to tohu abohu, which in Genesis means without form and void, to a primeval chaos. Now, for a long time, Jeremiah lived with the possibility that he might be a false prophet because Jerusalem had not fallen. But when Jerusalem did fall, nobody was going to accuse him of being a false prophet because the earth had not gone back to chaos. That was what that language had meant. So we have to be very careful, and I appreciate this is technical stuff to take on board at this time of night, but so that a lot of the prophecies are not about, in fact, the collapse of the, uh, of the universe, that they're actually about the fall of Jerusalem. So, Malachi, chapter three, verse 16. He says, you know, there were some who fear Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Some, just some. Yeah. Not everybody. So we're now not all Israel is Israel. Yeah. There's and fearing Yahweh, that's a phrase in Hebrew to describe the person who, mm -hmm. instead of choosing good and bad on their own terms, yeah. like yep. goes to Yahweh and says, Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom, and I will fear you in the best way possible and do what you say. Yeah. So there's a crew, Malachi is describing a crew within Israel okay. that are the ones who fear Yahweh. And they get together and they, when they talk together, Yahweh listens mm -hmm. and hears them. And so a scroll of remembrance was written before him, before Yahweh, about those who fear Yahweh and who love to meditate on his name. They ponder his name. Is this a different word here? Because... It's not Hagah. It's not Hagah. No, it's Chashav. But it's to muse and to hold at the forefront of your attention. Mm. So there's this crew within Israel who fear Yahweh. Yeah. 
And these are the servants? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. And what they love to do is to ponder the scroll of remembrance, which is, I think it's a reference to, well, as we're going to see to the, to the Torah? To the Torah. Okay. Yeah. Just wait for it. Just call the Torah, guys. Yeah. <laughs> then what we're told is uh, a little quote from Yahweh. This is what Yahweh of hosts says They will be mine. They are my treasured possession. I will have compassion on them as a man has compassion on his son, who is his servant. So there's a day coming. Yahweh's going to do something on the day. And this crew that actually fears him, they will become the treasured possession. And that's a big glowing hyperlink to the Torah. How so? Um, treasured possession. When Yahweh brings Israel to Mount Sinai and says, Keep my covenant. We're making a covenant. I brought you out of all the nations to be my people. Keep my covenant. And if you do, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, uh -huh. a holy nation, and a treasured possession. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, in other words, all of Israel has proven themselves unfaithful to the covenant. But there's this crew of those who fear Yahweh and love to meditate on his name. <laughs> yeah. And they love to hear the scroll read before them. And those are Yahweh's covenant people who are like a subset within Israel. So on that day, when Yahweh does this, what we're told is you will see a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. You'll see a distinction between the one who serves God and one who does not serve God. Because look, the days who's come. The, who's the you here? Who's, is this Malachi talking to, uh, this or is, this is God still talking? Well, it's, yeah, it's hard because... It's mentioning God oh. in the third person. Yeah. So it seems like it's Malachi, again, talking to those who fear the Lord. Okay. And on the day of the Lord that's coming, there's going to be this distinction, yeah. a separation between the righteous and the wicked, the servants of God, and those who don't actually serve God. Okay. The day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the arrogant and everyone who does wickedness will become stubble. You know, like chaff that the wind yeah. blows away. This is exactly where my mind went. Like reading Jesus without this, how should I say this? Huh. I've heard Jesus, you hear Jesus talk a lot about separating the wheat from the chaff. Oh, totally. The righteous from the Sh wicked. Sheep and the goats. Sheep and the goats. Yep. Yep. And reading Malachi here in light of what we've talked about, what Moses predicted. Yeah. This was very centered in yeah. Israel's story. Yeah. But Jesus was coming and saying, look, there's going to be a group of people mm -hmm. who are going to stay faithful mm -hmm. and they, I'm finding them. Mm -hmm. I'm getting that crew. Yeah. Yeah. And it just makes what Jesus was saying like so much kind of clearer. It's good. It's good. Yeah. That's totally right. The fact that there's this crew within Israel that calls themselves the God fearers who love to meditate on the name and that they're the righteous. These are the people from whom the Tanakh comes. Yeah. This is the minority report crew. Yeah. Within Israel, this is the prophets. Yeah. This is the crew of covenant faithful Israelites that was a minority throughout most of Israel's history. That's what we're meditating on. Mm. And that Yahweh is going to bring about a day that like fire will separate the consumables from the things that can endure the fire. A great test. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And this is what John the Baptist is on about when he starts. It's exactly. like that day's coming. That's totally right. Yep. So let's keep reading. Okay. So the coming day will consume the wicked and will not leave behind for them root or branch. But for you who fear my name, that burning fire is like the sun of righteousness rising, like day one of Genesis, <laughs> like the sunrise mm -hmm. with healing in its wings. And you will go out and leap like Fattened calves. <laughs> Leap like fattened calves. <laughs> Which is a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> the joy of a full, hearty calf. Yeah. Yeah. Like a well-fed calf yeah. gets the gate opened and, and it's just, just like, bucking around. go for it. Yeah. Woo. And it, yeah, just, yeah. So it's so funny, like there's a fire coming and depending on how you relate to the fire, it can either keep you warm and bring you joy, mm. like the sunrise. Mm. Or it can consume you. Yeah. And you've got to, just like the fire that, of Yahweh that came on Mount Sinai, mm. the people were convinced it would consume them. So mm -hmm. they didn't go up. But then when Moses and the elders go up, they're not consumed. Yeah. God lets them enjoy his presence yeah. and have a meal in his presence. Mm. 
So this gets even more intense. So you who fear my name, who experience my fire as like a sunrise that heals you, you will trample down the wicked and they will be like ash underneath the soles of your feet on the day that I'm going to act. Now the wicked here, these are the ones that aren't fearing God's name. And am I to think of just, is Malachi just centering in on a distinction between Israelites Mm. who fear, don't fear God, or really just like this crew that fears God and like the whole rest of creation. Yeah. It seems centered on Israel. The whole book seems centered on Israel. But okay. remember, Israel exists as a, you know, a Dispersed. microcosm of all of all humanity. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in other words, what Yahweh, and that's the whole story, is what Yahweh's doing with Israel is an image of what he's doing with all humanity. Okay. Yeah. So there's a day coming that will separate those who are faithful to Yahweh and those who are not, and fire, imagery. Why yeah. would that be... Um, t- <laughs> We get all this sounds really nice, like healing in the wings, the sun of righteousness, mm-hmm. and then you know, leaping around like fat and calves. Even that, you can kind of figure yeah, out. Yeah, and then he's like, and then you get to trample the wicked. It's yeah. like, well, yeah, I yeah. mean, well, okay. So I hear back. Think this is the cap to the prophets. Uh-huh. So the prophets begin with Israel called to go crush the seed of the snake living in the land in the garden land, which in the narrative is you know like the giants. And the yeah. Nephilim and all of their snake seed in the in the land of Canaan. I think that's the image here, but it's a troubling image, yeah, for us. And we've named well, this before. It is for me, and it is for a lot of people. But, I, me but too. there's also a visceral, like, destroy your enemies thing that happens for people. Yeah. It's kind of like yeah. those people are in the way. Yep, they're the enemies. We got to get them. Yep. yep, and that doesn't you know square yeah. with the teachings of Jesus. Totally. And the apostles. That's totally right. So you get to these places where it's like, I get it. Like when people cause evil, mm-hmm. it's like you're just kind of like everything inside you just like, oh, I hope they get what they deserve. Yeah. Yeah. But you read this through a Jesus lens and you're like, trample the wicked? I don't know. Totally. Yeah. It seems like Jesus would take a phrase like this and he's he saw himself with orders to let his enemies trample him. Right. And he said, that's how the kingdom of God's going to come. Yeah. So you can't to read Malachi as a part of a unified story at least of Jesus it means you can't just rip this passage out of context and yeah. make it mean whatever you want it to mean. But I think in the context what it, you know, in the context this is written among a persecuted religious minority within a people that is a persecuted yeah, people group. ethnic minority mm. living in an occupied territory under a, centuries of Oppression. Empires and oppression. Yeah. So I don't know what it's like yeah. to have enemies and to have experiences like that generation after generation. And I think that's a part of what the vision of a world set right is a world where the tables get turned and the mighty fall from their thrones and the, the poor are elevated. And I think that's the kind of visceral feeling yeah. that's coming out in a moment like this of trampling the wicked under yeah. the soles of your feet. But we have to, but to figure out what does that actually mean to trample the wicked or the soles of your feet when through the lens of Jesus, yeah, it's not what you would expect. It's the opposite. <laughs> so what Jesus said, yeah, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. Yeah, that's right. So that requires some sensitivity for yeah. how to do biblical interpretation. That's yep. Okay, so that's all about the day of Yahweh. Okay. So we were meditating on this little crew, yeah, within Israel, right. Then there's a day coming that'll separate that crew from the wicked. Last paragraph of Malachi, last paragraph of the prophets. Remember the Torah of my servant Moses that I commanded him at Mount Horeb to all Israel, you know, the statutes and the judgments. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Because, well, you know, I read that scroll of remembrance Mm -hmm. that those who fear the Lord. Okay. Right? So this is bookending this chapter in a way. Yeah. So this this whole last paragraph is designed as a symmetry with the Torah scroll is at the beginning and, the, and at the end. Yeah. So remember, there's, there's a day of Yahweh coming that will separate the righteous and the wicked. So let's think more about that. I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the day of Yahweh that is great and fear-inspiring. One other thing, Jesus told stories 
many stories. Jesus told stories, two in particular, one in Matthew, one in Luke, about somebody going away on a journey, giving his servants money to trade with and do business with, and then coming back to see how they were getting on. Many Christians have read those stories as though this is about the second coming at the end of the Christian history when the church will be judged according to whether it's done what Jesus wanted it to do in the meantime. It's actually very clear, particularly in Luke's version of that story, in Luke 19, that's not what's going on at all. And here's something which most modern Christians have not even begun to get their heads around. Jews in Jesus' day lived in hope, and the center of the hope was that the God who had abandoned them at the time of the exile 450 years earlier or so would eventually come back in all his shining glory, to live in the temple at last. There is no scene in the whole second temple period which says he's come back at last. Jesus is telling stories about the God who left his people things to do, but would come back. And he's telling those stories because Jesus himself, in coming to Jerusalem, is embodying the return of Israel's God to Zion. This is a whole huge theme, which I think most people as they read the Gospels or Paul have not even begun to imagine, but it looms very large in the Jewish writings of the period, and somehow we have to factor it in. So yes, the second coming is important, but the thing which was gonna happen within a generation was the fall of Jerusalem, and we don't find in the second century and the third century people saying, oh dear, oh dear, hasn't happened yet. They still say, no, it might happen at any time. They are, they are not stuck on the this generation thing. Okay, a couple things. Elijah. One is, great, we're getting another prophet. This is kind of the like, yeah, it's where we're used to hand off to a new prophet. Hand off to, yep, prophet. But what's weird here is Elijah, yeah, he already came and went. Came about 400 years ago <laughs> <laughs> from Malachi's perspective. So yeah. that's odd. Yeah. So notice this pairing of Moses and Elijah. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting, Elijah, the narratives about Elijah that are in the middle of the King's scroll are all so hyperlinked and patterned after the Moses story. Yeah. Culminating in the fact that Elijah goes to Mount Sinai mm. looking to meet Yahweh and he you know he had, there's an appearance of fire, cloud, storm mm. and he talks with Yahweh on top of the mountain. So he's clearly portrayed as a prophet like Mo Oh yeah, he gets fed in the wilderness. Oh really? Yeah, food some ravens God oh, commands ravens yeah, to feed him. Yeah, feed him. So he's portrayed as a new Moses. Yeah. A prophet like Moses. And when Jesus goes up to the mountain and yes. transfigures into this figure, yeah. who shows up with them? Yep. Moses and Elijah. Exactly. So what Moses is to the Torah, Elijah is to the narratives of the prophets. Oh, okay. He becomes kind of so, like an icon of the heaven on earth mediator who ultimately fails, but he was pretty awesome. <laughs> So you could read this and say, oh, Elijah's getting resurrected and coming back. Or you can say, oh, just like we're getting someone like Moses, but yep. better. Yep. We're also getting someone like Elijah, but better. That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. So notice then what's just happened is that really feels like similar to the end of Deuteronomy. Right. Where Moses has been like scroll of the Torah, be faithful to the covenant. Yeah. There's a separation happening within Israel. Mm. The faithful are called the servants. Yeah. He'll vindicate them. And in the meanwhile, wait for the coming prophet who will restore and do all the stuff that Moses and now that Elijah did. Yeah. So both the Torah and the prophets conclude with hyperlinked conclusions, pointing you forward to a great seed of the woman mm. who's going to come, bring restoration and defeat evil. A prophet. Yeah, a prophet figure. Mm -hmm. Yep. And a day of the Lord. And that it gets intensified. I suppose in the Deuteronomy scroll, the language of day of the Lord is in there, right? Ah, well, not in Deuteronomy 34. Okay. It's anticipated in Moses' song. Oh, is it? Okay. That, you know, it's all going to hit the fan yeah. at one point. Yeah. But Malachi turns up the volume just calling it the coming day. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how the prophets begins and ends with Joshua and Malachi. In the arrangement of the Tanakh, then the next and final third collection called the Ketuvim begins with the Psalm scroll. And if you look at what is in the Tanakh, 
the next literary unit after what we just read in Malachi in the Hebrew Bible, it's Psalm 1, mm. which we've read many times. So I just want to scan it real quick because we're going to see all the same themes coming up again. Yeah. Have we have we jammed on it on the podcast? Oh, maybe not. You know what? Maybe not. We don't have time yeah. to read through this whole psalm. Mm -hmm. We are going to put out a whole video on the psalm. Yes, we are. Next yeah. year in, in 2023. 20. That's true. And the reason why is because it talks about the kind of person who meditates on the Torah yeah. as a tree of life. Yeah. But now you're situating this whole idea yeah. of the person who meditates on the Torah in the largest context possible. Of the Tanakh. Of whole the whole Tanakh. Tanakh. That's right. And this now, you're talking about it as seams. So we're going from the mm -hmm. seam of the prophets now into the last third of the Hebrew Bible, the writings, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is Psalms, and then there's Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Yeah, yeah. Job. Lamentations and Job. And yep. You've got Ruth and Esther and, the, and yep. Ezra yeah. Nehemiah. All of it. Song of Songs. Song of Songs. Chronicles. Daniel. It's all the good stuff. Okay. It feels like kind of like... Yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah. The, ex, the extras. Yeah, totally. And it's interesting because every one of them is hyperlinked like mad into back into the Torah and prophets. And this is often referred to as the writings or the Psalms. Jesus calls it the Psalms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Psalms is the head scroll of this third and final collection, at least the way Jesus saw it. Yep. So we're at the seam there. And yep. you're saying as we read the first literary unit at the seam moving into this last third. Yes. What are the ideas? Yeah. That we're going to meditate on. Totally. Yep. And it just happens to be. Yeah. So let me just, it doesn't take that long. I'm just going to read Psalm 1. Okay. With a good life. Blessed. Oh, yeah. Oh, how blessed. Oh, how blessed is the man. Is the man. You say the good life. The good life. Yeah. Of the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. There it is. Okay. Oh, the wicked. We've oh, read yeah. this a lot, and now the wicked's just like, that's just... Yeah. I, I just learned a lot about the wicked in the story of the prophets, yeah. and then in, in the last paragraph of Malachi. Okay. And doesn't stand in the path of sinners, doesn't sit in the seat of mockers. Rather, his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh, the instruction of Yahweh. And on Yahweh's instruction, he meditates day and night. You're saying instruction, that's just a, a, a way to translate Torah. Yep. Yeah. Where uh, law is the typical English translation yeah. in, our, in our Bibles. So there's this guy who doesn't associate with the wicked. Yeah. He doesn't th walk, stand, or sit mm -mm. with them. That's right. His delight is in Yahweh's instruction, Torah. And on the Torah, he meditates day and night. Meditates. And that's what Moses said to do. Mm -hmm. there, Joshua was... It's what Yahweh... Told Joshua to How do. How Yahweh told Joshua he would win the military campaign. Yeah, to meditate. It's verbatim, copy and pasted. Wow, okay. So now all of a sudden, Psalm 1 is linked to the end of Malachi, mm -hmm. distinction of righteous and wicked, and it's super hyper linked to Joshua chapter 1. Because yeah. what this guy is doing is what Joshua was told to do. He will become like a tree planted by streams of water, which gives its fruit in its time, its leaf just never withers. And everything he does, he's successful. Success. And that's in Malachi yes. and in Joshua. Yes. And that word success is filled with the same letters as the word wisdom. Hokma. Which, um, it's the word haskil, but it's what the woman saw when she looked at the tree, that it was desirable to make haskil. Oh, that's a different word. Yep. It's a synonym for wisdom. S okay. Yeah. Haskil. So, this person... The Joshua-like figure becomes like the tree of life, mm. planted by the river with perpetual right leaves and fruit. Yeah, and in doing so, they become the thing the woman wanted. The thing the woman wanted when yeah. she grabbed for the tree of knowing good and bad. Whoa. So this is hyperlinked to Genesis one through three. Wow. So do, whoever wrote Psalm one <laughs> wrote it as a synthesis yeah. of. The beginning and ending of the Torah. Yeah. And the beginning and the ending of the Torah. That's so rad to think about. It's really rad. It, you know, it makes you think of the just the brilliance of a Mozart or, you know, yeah, like, yeah. where they just yeah. have so many things happening <laughs> that they can just pull from all of these 
musical motifs and bring them together in new ways and in ways that just bring you a sense of awe and make you kind of wonder like, how did someone's mind (laughs) do this? Yeah, Yeah, totally. Yeah, this is just the first half of Psalm 1. And it's weaving together language, words, imagery from the beginning of Genesis, the end of Deuteronomy, the beginning of Joshua, the end of Malachi. And we're not even done yet. (laughs) Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind drives away. Oh, yeah. yeah. The chaff. So what Malachi said, Mm -hmm. the wicked will become like stubble consumed in the flame. Therefore, the wicked won't stand in the judgment. Oh, yeah, that sounds like Malachi nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. In the assembly of the righteous. And we're talking about a crew. Oh, a crew that fears oh, Yahweh and loves to ponder his name. Yeah. Yeah. Because Yahweh knows the path of the righteous. Remember? Because he said, that crew is my special possession, hmm. but the path of the wicked will perish. So all of a sudden, the whole Psalm scroll is introduced by upholding this model human who is like Joshua, and like Adam and Eve, and like Moses, mm. <laughs> who is this embodiment of the instruction and Torah of Yahweh, and they become like a tree of life mm. that provides life to everyone around them. And Yahweh, is, he's gotten his eye on that person. And in the coming separation between the righteous and the wicked, that one will flourish like the Garden of Eden. That's the imagery here. So, Whatever the Torah is about is also what the prophets are about, is also what the writings are about. Yeah. Because the beginnings and endings have all been coordinated. So if you've ever been confused about what the Bible, the Hebrew Old Testament is about, welcome to the club. (laughs) (laughs) But whoever organized it together has given us clues in these matching mirror beginnings and endings as to what the big ideas are. And so let's at least, if you're going to read on to Joshua after this year of Torah and go on into the prophets, at least kind of let these passages be your kind of guideposts for what to pay attention to. And when you say what the story is about, what you're saying is, if I could try to recap. Please. The story is about humanity, given the opportunity to be God's, the people of God, God's image. And they're given a Torah. Adam and Eve are given a Torah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they are meant to fear God and live in abundance in an abundant land with God, mm-hmm. where mm. God and creation are one. Heaven and earth are mm-hmm. one. Yeah. Or, well, God, God's presence is in the middle of creation. God's God presence. and creation are one. God, but, okay. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> God's presence is in the middle of creation. Yeah. And heaven and earth are one. Yeah. There you go. And so that isn't where humanity is at, obviously. Something went wrong. Mm-hmm. We've taken of the tree of knowing good and bad. And the whole story was about God saying, I'm going to fix this through some sort of human, seed of the woman, mm-hmm. who's going to defeat evil, make things right. And as we trace and find this person, we know this person is going to keep God's instruction as Torah. And we're, we're given a story of a people Mm -hmm. who are given an opportunity Mm -hmm. to kind of reboot a covenant relationship with new Torah, which now isn't a simple little like one command, one command. (laughs) It's a, it's a whole covenant code, which we have portions of Mm -hmm. in the Torah. And so Moses at the very end, as they're going to go back into the land, this image of the garden, he's saying, do what humanity has never been able to do. Mm. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the one yeah. thing, we've, yeah. no one's figured out, this is what you got to do. Yeah. You got to keep the Torah. Yeah. And for them, it was a, it was a covenant command. But for us reading the Torah, mm. it's, we don't have that like covenant law code, but what we have is scrolls that tell a story Mm. with some of the law code Mm -hmm. and that in and itself Mm. becomes God's instruction for us. Yeah, that's right. Kind of becomes a little meta at that point. And now we are hearing Moses say this to ancient Israel and we realize, oh, that's us too. Yeah. We are, we're, have the opportunity to 
And when you say that's us, are you talking about you and me sitting right here? <laughs> I am. Okay. Uh, but also at the prophets who have formed this mm-hmm. collection, mm-hmm. 800 years in the future. Right. Telling these stories, they're talking about them. Exactly. We have this opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. From the perspective of the people who put the Tanakh together, this yeah. is the crew sitting back in the land after the return from exile, but like the day of Yahweh and the new Eden has not come yeah. and we're waiting for it. Yeah. And so that's what it's, the whole thing's about. Mm-hmm. And there's so, there's so many more stories to go, mm-hmm. but let's frame the stories of Joshua yes. and, and moving forward. It's all about, will you yeah. like keep yeah. this covenant? Yep. And will you fear God yeah. and walk with him and find the place where heaven and earth unite? Mm-hmm. Now that we fast forward and there's been a great exile and there's an mm-hmm. opportunity to come back to the land and try again, mm-hmm. like, and we're still not figuring it out. Mm-hmm. Will you be that people? Mm-hmm. And when Psalm 1 starts, it's just this call, like, look mm-hmm. how beautiful the life is to actually be that kind mm-hmm. of person. Yeah. To meditate right. on the Torah. Yeah. Yep. Psalm 1 is describing what it would have been like if Adam and Eve <laughs> or Moses or Joshua or David had actually done the will of God consistently and from the heart, they would have become like trees of life to everyone around them. So Psalm 1 begins this collection. Yeah, the Psalm scroll, it's a whole meditation on all these themes through the form of poetry. But then you get the wisdom scrolls. And Proverbs begins by saying, like, every one of us is an Adam and Eve Hmm. sitting at the tree and take the tree of life that is wisdom. And trust, you know, live by God's wisdom. You get portraits of Daniel, who does live by God's wisdom, and he suffers miserably Mm. along with his people. And his moments of exaltation in Babylon become images of a son of man's exaltation through suffering over the nations. That's Daniel chapter 7. So, like, we're just working the themes. Yeah. In the writings, you're just all these creative ways of working the core themes over. But that's basically it. So the Tanakh comes to a conclusion with us sitting in the same position as the Israelites were with Moses, waiting to go into the garden land. Just kind of begging you to be part of the crew yeah. that decides to meditate on God's instruction mm-hmm. and to be that kind of person. Because to be that kind of person means that you can be the place where heaven and earth unite. Yeah. And that God can then unite heaven and earth through you and the crew. With also this vision of when that happens, it's going to be intense because yeah. it's going to be a reordering of, yeah. of everything. It's going to be another decreation, recreation, like the flood, like Sodom and Gomorrah, like the exile. But it'll be a recreation. Mm. And there we're back to the cycles of this thematic cycle or melody throughout the Hebrew Bible over and over and over again. And it's training all of us to see our lives as a cycle in the drama where every one of us has the potential to become a conduit for God's Eden blessing out to others if we will align ourselves with the will of God. And to its Jesus fulfillment, that God actually became the human partner that we've all failed to be on our behalf so that he could become the channel of eternal Eden blessing for all the nations so that even when I fail, If I'm attached to the one, that my failure has no chance of overcoming God's own faithfulness that's demonstrated in the coming of the Messiah, the snake crusher. Yeah, so much comes together in so many interesting ways. Yeah. I guess it makes me think, you know, Jesus does come and talk a lot about the language of Malachi, of the Mm -hmm. separating the Mm -hmm. wheat and the chaff. And he creates a crew, a faithful. Yeah. Like, but... You don't get stories of them just going and being like Torah students. Mm, mm. Like, you know, they become like students of the teachings of Jesus. Yeah. And, you know, you get a few stories of Jesus going to like synagogue and like reading the Torah. Mm -hmm. But it's not like a massive motif. Mm. Well, I suppose this is why the Sermon on the Mount is so pivotal. Mm. Because Jesus defines Torah observance as faithfulness to his vision of what it means to live by the Torah. Yeah, and he famously says, like, I've come to fulfill the Torah. Yeah, I haven't come to cancel the Torah and prophets. The opposite, I've come to fulfill them, which will lead to a greater righteousness. Mm. That actually, Torah gave you righteousness. Mm-hmm. The fulfillment of the Torah is going to give you greater righteousness. Greater righteousness. And then 
we're on into the Sermon on the Mount. Hmm. So in a way, he was about Torah observance, but the Torah observance dreamed of by Jeremiah or mm. Ezekiel, where God's spirit would write God's will on the heart so that you don't just observe commands, but just your very core is saturated with the will and desire of Yahweh so that you know how to live in alignment. I think it's a good place to end because and this gets back to what kind of literature is this? Mm. And this is lit, this is wisdom, messianic wisdom literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we go into it, any of these stories, any of these poems, these ideas are supposed to bring us to a place where our will and God's will align, our vision for mm. what it means to have the good life, what mm. righteousness is, that that becomes not something that we have to like even learn anymore or discern, mm. but like there's this like relationship with God yeah. that develops. Yeah. And what we get in Jesus and the apostles, the writings of the apostles is talking about mm -hmm. Jesus and his unity with Jesus mm. and the gift of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And then we still have these writings mm -hmm. to meditate mm -hmm. on. Yep. And all that kind of works together mm -hmm. to help us reclaim this thing of being the image of God. Yeah. That's right. And because, you know, we're brought into the story through Jesus Messiah, it's precisely through his story, his example, and what he accomplished for humanity that humanity couldn't do by itself. That all like creates a whole new cycle of the pattern that we are brought into. And I, yeah, that's what's so great about Jesus that portrayed as like the new human, because when I associate myself with him through trust, What's true of him becomes true of me. Or as Paul will say, the Messiah is my life. Hmm. And uh, it's not even fully me who's living anymore. It's me, but Messiah living in me hmm. and through me.